All right. Ladies, thank you so much for coming. And I think I want to start with prayer first, and then we'll move forward from there. Lord, thank you so much for bringing these ladies here safely tonight. And I pray for blessings upon each and every one, even the ones listening at home, Lord, that you will open our hearts tonight. And that the Holy Spirit will rise and give us comfort as we go over some things that aren't so comfortable to talk about and times that we have to sometimes examine things that are going on in our heart. So Lord, I pray that you give us comfort as we walk through this together and knowing that you are here, the best and the most gracious comforter that we could ever have. In your precious name, amen. So welcome, ladies. My name is Leslie Guttramson, and I don't expect you to remember the last name because that's a difficult one. But um, I was asked tonight to do a little um, presentation on turning a critical spirit into graciousness. Or grace and um, ha, when I was first asked by Lori to do this I kind of chuckled and went uh -huh, I don't know anything about a critical spirit but okay and the Lord went uh-huh really Leslie <laughs> okay let me show you a few things and as I kind of researched it and got dug more into it, I went I'm a critical spirit and I've had one for a very long time so um, as it turns out I can talk to you about a critical spirit because I happen to have one <laughs> but the beautiful thing about it is I'm no longer that critical spirit. The Lord has worked through me over these years, and I'm gonna show you some beautiful things that he taught me to do that turned me into the grace that he wants us to see today. And so when I introduce myself, I will say my name, but I'm also a redeemed child of God. And then I can go forward and say who I am, a mother, a wife, you know, a server in the church, and um, be able to claim God's grace. And so um, that is the gift and the beautiful thing about God's healing and his mercy on us. So um, just a little crowd breaker here. Let me get my little clicker going. Um, that is me and my husband, Rodney, and we've been going to this church for about five years. And uh, we both serve in a new ministry that the church has been doing through biblical counseling. And so I gained a lot of my um, data here from some biblical counseling websites so that you'll kind of see some of that come out as in the presentation too. And so let's move on. So a critical spirit. What exactly is a critical spirit? Um, oh, one, one claimer here. Um, I want to apologize if it sounds like, and it will sound like that I'm repeating myself because I am. Uh, one thing I have learned that for myself, when I am learning, I need to hear it over and over and over and over. And so I am going to be repeating myself. You're going to hear some principles repeated. You're going to hear verses repeated. But I found that if I have a behavior I need to change, especially sin, I need to hear it a lot. And so I have also found that um, God's word kind of does the same thing. And that when he wants us to really hear something and learn something, he repeats it a couple times. And so henceforth, I'm doing the same thing. Plus, I needed to fill a lot of time, so. <laughs> but um, really, so I wanted to talk a little bit about what is a critical spirit. So um, in Hebrew, I can't really pronounce the words or read it, but I found it interesting that the two words that came up was broken and then utterly. And so that to me seemed very important, that you are utterly broken uh, with a critical spirit. Similar words um, was derogatory, reproving, and scathing. So not such pretty words describing a critical spirit. The definition, a critical spirit is a negative attitude of the heart that seeks to condemn, tear down, destroy with words and thoughts. In contrast, a constructive criticism heart attitude are meant to build up. A critical spirit creates blind spots in a person's heart and mind, causing them to believe that they're being constructive but in reality, it is sinful and acting as an ungodly and does not leave room for Christ to work, uh, especially in the heart. Those blind spots keep Christ away. A critical spirit is not difficult to recognize. We can see it pretty quickly. The fruit is evident. Someone with a critical spirit is prone to complaining, seeing the glass half empty, faces very met, unmet expectations, senses failure, mostly in others, not themselves, and is very judgmental. Critical spirits are pretty much no fun to be with. So there are four types of a critical spirit or bad habits. First one uh, is the gossiper. A gossiper is one who reveals secrets, going about as a talebearer or a scandal monger. 
She has privileged information about people and proceeds to reveal that information to others with sinful motives without their knowledge um, or approval. Gossipers attempt to make themselves significant to the hearer by appearing to be a source of all knowledge. At times, they go under the pretense of sharing so that you might pray for them. So um, also to examine, is this really your story to tell? Or is it something that they should be sharing? The biblical perspective is in 1 Timothy 5.13. At the same time, they also learn to be idle as they go around from house to house, and not merely idle, but also gossips and busybodies talking about things not proper to mention. Proverbs 20:19 says, He who goes about as a slanderer reveals secrets. Therefore, do not associate with a gossip. Pretty clear there. The second one is a slanderer. A slanderer is a person who makes false statements in order to damage a person's reputation. She does not care about the truth or correct an error. A slanderer creates error in order to inflict harm. The biblical perspective of Proverbs 10, 18. He who conceals hatred, his lying lips, and he who spreads slander is a fool. Uh, 10, 18. Mm -hmm. And then Proverbs 16, 28. A perverse man spreads strife, and a slanderer separates intimate friends. That's pretty serious if you're separating Christian people. The third one is judgmentalism. A judgmental person has an excessively critical point of view, characterized by a tendency to judge harshly. She lacks empathy for others' viewpoints because she believes her viewpoint is correct. She believes she has the ability to know others' motives. I call this mind reading because you just don't know what's in their mind and heart. She has the amazing skill to point to others' mistakes while minimizing her own. The biblical perspective is James 2.13. For judgment will be merciless to one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. The fourth one is the complainer. A complainer is a person who is habitually negative about others and circumstances of life. They are characterized by discontentment and ingratitude. The biblical perspective is James 5.9. Do not complain, brethren, against one another, so that you yourselves may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing right at the door. Philippians 2.14, do all things without grumbling and complaining. Keep in mind, you don't have to have a severe case of these bad habits. Even a little one of these four is sinful in God's eyes, and he knows our hearts. So obviously, the critical spirits are destructive, tearing down both the recipient and the giver of the criticism. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out, or you will be destroyed by each other. That's Galatians 5, 14 through 15. In addition to a critical spirit, it's displeasing to God. The Bible speaks against such critical judgment. In Matthew 7, 1 through 2, Jesus says, Judge not, that you be not judged. For with the judgment you pronounce, you may be judged. And with the measure you use it, it will be measured to you. Jesus is not saying that we shouldn't point out some discerning or things that we want to ignore, especially sin. But because of our fallen nature of the world, he is also not saying that we must never, any under circumstance, criticize anyone else. In fact, the Bible tells us that we are to judge rightly, and that's John 7, 24. However, we are not to criticize with malicious intent or out of pride, hypocrisy, self-righteousness. We cannot assume that we are partial or that we can fairly exact our standards on others, for we are humans and we naturally have deceitful hearts. That also allows the blind spots I talked about earlier and inappropriate comparisons. In Jeremiah 19, excuse me, 17, 9, the heart is deceitful above all things and any beyond cure. Who can understand it? Only God can. Uh, let's see. And only God can judge with perfect accuracy. Our judgment is only correct when it is spoken by a renewed nature. 
in Christ. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you in all the truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. That's John 16, 13. Only when we are submitted to Christ and honest with ourselves are we able to judge correctly and to serve to edify rather to, than to destroy. So there was a case study several years ago. A psychiatrist wrote a magazine article called Release from Nervous Tension. In his article, he outlined his research into the causes of mental and emotional disturbance. From over 10,000 case studies, he discovered there is one common trait with all the patients who suffered from severe tension. They were habitual fault finders, constant critics of other people and things around them. Those free from tension were the least critical. The conclusion of this study is that fault finding is a pre prelude or a mark of a nervous or mentally unbalanced person. What's the bottom line? Those who wish to remain in good emotional, mental, and spiritual health should learn, to be free, should learn to free themselves from negative critical judgment attitude. As shown in this study, the critical spirit can be very detrimental. The damage to a person's personal faith or the health of the church that are involved in over time, if left unchecked, it prevents us from seeing, appreciating, and enjoying all that is truly good in the world especially all that God actively is doing. We get blinded by our criticism. It is the exact opposite of wearing the hope rose-colored glasses. A critical spirit is like putting on sunglasses when the day is full of clouds. Everything in life begins to take on a dark drab hue. The critical person becomes, sorry, comes to expect even hope that everything will go negative or that it will have something wrong with it. Taken to extreme, a critical person can assume the role of devil's advocate. One's very identity can be marked by this to need that kind of negativity. But critical people aren't just hurting themselves. They are also negatively affecting others as well. A critical spirit in action is the opposite of loving your neighbor as yourself. Relationships are broken, and when there's gossip, slander, and judgment, Especially when we're critical towards others, we put ourselves in the authoritative position over them. This isolates a critical person from fellowship with others. People tend to separate themselves from a harsh and critical person. So what are the causes of a critical spirit? Here's just a few. They're also called bad habits. Our sinful or selfish nature is referred to in the Bible as the flesh. A critical person is walking in the flesh and not in the spirit. They are choosing a critical spirit and not a holy spirit. And Jonah 1.12 gives us a really good example of Jonah realizing his critical spirit against the Ninevites and confessing it to the men. Jonah said, pick me up and throw me into the sea, he replied, and it will become calm. I know that it's my fault that this great storm has come upon you. Rather than drawing on God's strength, and his perspective, the critical person relies upon his own resources, just as we saw with Jonah. Running from God and heading down as Jonah did, critical inhabit, sorry, inhibits faith and quenches the Spirit of God, causing us to live based on negative feelings and not faith. Holy Spirited people will always be optimistic and full of hope because they know they love and serve a God that is great and gracious. On the other hand, the outlook on a sinful nature, which is the flesh, will be one of despair. Why? Because it's apart from Christ. We have no realistic basis for hope when we're critical. This is so true in my life during the time that I spent um, being a critical spirit. Uh, I had a very unforgiving heart, and my days were very hopeless, even though I couldn't see that. So let's consider some important causes contributing to a cultivating critical spirit or bad habits. So the first one um, is a poor self-concept, <clears throat> and I've been guilty of each and every one of these. It has been said, hurting people hurt people. When you meet people who are constantly critical, you can be pretty sure that they're suffering from a poor self-concept, which is a work-based self-concept. 
They see themselves as unattractive, failing, or in some manner unworthy. Perhaps they even condemn themselves. Finding faults in others perhaps keeps them from seeing their own. Feeling and dealing with their own pain is also ignored. Uh, the next one, little or no grace. A critical person has experienced little or no grace from God. It's far easier to see others' sin than our own, which we all hear about the log in your eye problem. Judgmental people rarely get in touch with God's perspective on their own fractures or with God's incredible gift of forgiveness. Have we honestly faced our sin and experienced God's grace? Have you ever wept over your sins? When you see the sins of others, are you aware that you're just as capable of those same sins? Next one is pessimism or negativity. A negative emotional focus, a bad attitude, or a negative, negative cynical secular view of life. That was a tough one. A negative person may have unconfessed sin in their life. There are some individuals who are so negative they assume the role of devil's advocate. It seems that no matter what opinion you have, they will either argue with you or come up with one better. The devil gives us enough problems we don't need to have anybody advocating for him. Next one is insecurity. Criticism is often a conscious or subconscious means to elevate one's own self-esteem or self-image. By putting others down, they're inwardly trying to build themselves up by feeling more important or appearing more knowledgeable. Envy of a good fortune of others is often the cause of a critical spirit or an action. We need to learn to rejoice for others who are rejoicing and be happy for their good fortunes and blessings from the Lord. The next one is immaturity. Christians must always keep their faith focused on Christ and His Word and not on others who invariably disappoint us. Immature believers haven't progressed very far in their faith and they're perhaps too dependent upon the faith of other Christians. Unfortunately, when they begin to notice the flaws and shortcomings of others, this becomes subconscious threat to their own faith in their walk. Criticism becomes a reaction of disappointment because unrealistic expectations have others and of others has been crushed. The unrenewed mind. Put-downs, making fun of others, criticisms, sarcasms are the world's way of reacting to the faults of others. However, as Christians, we shouldn't behave this way. Paul says that our thinking and attitude should be regularly renewed by God's Word, which teaches us to bear the infirmities of the weak, to love, to show compassion, and offer encouragement. Romans 12, 2, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and prove what God's will is, a good, pleasing, and perfect will. If you're focusing on these things, what is true, what is noble, what is pure, what is lovely, what is admirable, and what is excellent, and what is praiseworthy, you won't have time to be thinking of these other things. Envy. Are you looking at what others have or doing and being critical of their blessings? If it isn't envy driving a critical spirit, it's probably pride. The root of bitterness develops when we fail to find the grace of God to forgive. When we fail to forgive others, we become angry, bitter, and resentful, and not better. Hebrews 12, 15. Look after each other so not one of you will fail to find God's best blessings. Watch out that no bitterness takes a root among you, for as it springs up, it causes deep trouble. Hurting may be in their spiritual lives. Such people develop a negative emotional focus by harboring bitterness and resentment towards one who has offended them. Our ability to live healthy, happy, harmonious lives is largely related to our willingness and ability to constantly forgive and ask for forgiveness. So this was where I really got tripped up. When I realized that I had a great amount of unforgiveness in my life, it turned into great bitterness. And that kept me running from the Lord for a very long time. And so um, it's very important if we fe haven't forgiven people, even clear back into younger years, that that bitterness will root and take over your heart. And I experienced that, unfortunately, and it kept me running way too long. Another one, bad company. The reality is, for better or for worse,
we become like those whom we associate with. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 33, We should not be deceived. Bad company ruins good morals or corrupts good character. If you're basically a positive person you associate, and you associate with a lot of negative people and you are not having a positive influence on them, then they're going to, over time, have the adverse influence on you and pull you down to their negativity. Last one. Oh, go ahead. That's a 1533. Sure. So our last one is Satan. He specializes in influencing negative, obsessive sin attitudes and behavior. He may use any of these factors or other techniques to influence a complaining and critical attitude and to stir up turmoil and strife between the body of Christ. We must be on guard so that we won't be used as a tool of Satan to discourage or tear down others through criticism. In Ephesians 4.27, Paul warns us not to give Satan an opportunity to be used by him. Again, don't allow Satan to have another tactic. So, do you have a critical spirit? Any of these feel a little familiar? So here's the hard part. You thought we were already having a hard part. Do you think others and God can see your heart? your critical spirit? If so, how does that look? So looking at again at the critical spirit, it dwells on the negative, looks for flaws rather than positive. They're constantly complaining or criticizing and usually upset with something or somebody. They often have little control over their tongues, their temper, and their tendencies for gossip, slander, strife, and malice. These are some of the sins that Paul speaks about in Romans. Do you know anybody with a critical spirit? I'm sure we all do. But the question is, what really we need to consider is, do you have a critical spirit? And if so, how would you know? If you have a critical or judgmental spirit, you would probably refer to it lightly, saying something like, I'm just being discerning, or I'm just being honest, or call it like it is. Do you focus on your negative feelings? Thinking about bad or wrong some, some, the, the, how bad or wrong someone has been to you. Do you blame shift? Do you say things like, I can't believe he's such a bad listener? Or man, he's full of himself? Or she's so vain? Or look at her clothes. I wonder how much money she spends on her wardrobe. Sometimes the negativity of our hearts finds its way to our tongue. And other times it just stays in your heart, but God still sees that. Either way, the root of sin is a critical spirit is the same. And remember, like I said, God can see it. So a couple of things to look at. Um, examining your heart. Do you set up the problem? I'm sorry, I jumped ahead there a little bit. No, I didn't. <laughs> so do you set up the problem without seeking a solution with somebody? You just don't have a question. It's always questioning. You sacrifice people for the process. You suck life rather than infusing life. You take the team's focus off the mission. You focus on you, I, or they, but never we. You take great pleasure in the criticism. So in looking at all this, how did we even get to the critical spirit phase? As with most sin, Having a critical spirit is a perverse of something God had made to be good. In this case, a longing for God and his perfection. Ecclesiastes 3.11 says God has made everything beautiful in its time. Also, he has put eternity into man's heart, yet so that he cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. We live in a fallen world and we are often impatient to enter into the glorious perfection for which we are originally created. In the sense, it is good that we can see what's lacking in the world. After all, the world is not as it should be, nor are we as we should be. Recognizing the, world is, the world's insufficiency helps us to acknowledge our need for the Savior. But having a critical spirit can blind us to the grace and beauty that God continues to bestow on us every day. A critical spirit can also be seen as a perversion of discernment. 
Often those accused of having a critical spirit make valid points. They just point it out in a very unpleasant manner. So what are some of the motives behind a critical spirit? A critical spirit comes from within a heart of a person. Mark 7 tells us that sin, such as evil thoughts, coveting, deceit, envy, and slander proceed from within a person. There are several factors that continue to develop from a critical spirit. The first one is the self factor. This includes jealousy or envy. It includes vengeance, anger, hatred, and holding grudges for the purpose of gaining personal and by destroying the other person. The fear factor. This involves feeling threatened by someone or feeling anxiety towards someone which produces a critical spirit as a way of self-protection. The control factor. This is a feeling of out of control and using manipulation and shaming someone in order to gain your control. The pride factor. This is when someone is focused on self, self-worship. Stuart Scott said prideful people believe that they or they should be the source of what is good, right, and worthy of praise. With this attitude, where, where are we putting God? I'm in big, I am big, and God is small. We, we've got the opposite thing going on. I know this seems way over, to go over so many ways to look at a critical spirit, but I really wanted you to see how many different ways that this can really creep into your heart and your life. It's hidden sin. For myself, I didn't think I, like I said, had a critical spirit until I considered the pride factor. Self-worship. I am better than you, so I won't forgive you. And I spent many years feeling that way. Um, and I kind of shared a little bit about that. In the beginning, I was very hurt by several people early on in my life, and I didn't feel that they needed my forgiveness. They didn't deserve it. Myself was more important. I wanted to preserve my hurt. And living in that kind of moved along in life, and it just kept piling on, piling on, more hurt, more disappointment, more unmet expectations, all these things that I kind of have mentioned, and that certainly built up a really good critical spirit. So moving on here. Ah, thought you could use a little break. <laughs> these are my grandkids, Aiden, and then Layla, and then Harper. Uh, could, could use a little um oh, I know he's so big oh he, he's very proud of himself that he might be taller than me by next year oh. <laughs> and he's working real real good on getting there so okay back to business what do we do what where, where do we get our help this is where I talked about choosing a little bit earlier we chose a critical spirit and so now we need to choose healing and choose graciousness here are some ways to move from a critical spirit into grace. If the cause of a critical spirit is lifestyle based on living by our sinful nature, we need to cultivate a new nature and learn to be controlled by the Holy Spirit. Galatians 5.16 Obey only the Holy Spirit's instructions. He will tell you where to go, what to do, and when you won't always be doing the wrong things. Your evil nature wants you to do. Be filled instead with the Holy Spirit and controlled by Him. If the cause of a critical spirit is poor self-concept based on our works, we need to cultivate a healthy self-concept based on God's grace, not our works. 1 Corinthians 15.10 It is by the grace of God I am what I am, and His grace to me is not without effect. No, I work harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that is with me. If the cause of a critical spirit is that we have experienced little or no grace from God, then we need to humble ourselves before God, confess and repent our sins, and ask for forgiveness. James 4, 6, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. If the cause of a critical spirit is our insecurity, Due to a large measure of lack of self-acceptance, we need to learn to accept God's grace for us and find true security in God's love for us. Romans 8 says, Nothing can separate us from the love of God found in Christ Jesus our Lord. 
If the cause of a critical spirit is a negative emotional focus or a negative worldview, we need to learn to see God's view of Jesus and not from a worldly secular view. 2 Corinthians 5.16 Though we were once regard Christ from a worldly point of view, we do so no longer. Again, we need to be thinking on whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever right, what's pure, what is lovely, what is admirable, and anything that is excellent or praiseworthy. In this verse, I don't even get past true. If I put in my mind what is true, and I seek the truth of the Lord and His Word, I don't have to move any further. So just keeping what is true. If the cause of a critical spirit is immaturity resulting from the improper faith focus, we need to learn to focus our faith on atoning sacrifices of Christ that God has promised us. Hebrews 12, 2-3 Keep your eyes on Jesus, our leader and our instructor. He was willing to die a shameful death on the cross because of the joy he knew would be his afterwards. And now he sits in a high place of honor by the throne of God. If you want to keep from becoming a faint-hearted and weary, think about his patience and the sins of men that did such terrible things to him. If the cause of a critical spirit is an unrenewed mind based on the world's way of reacting, we need to submit ourselves to God and be daily transformed by the renewing of our minds. Romans 12, 1 through 2, I urge you, in the view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve of what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. If the critical spirit, sorry, the cause of a critical spirit is a root of bitterness due to the lack of forgiveness on our part, we need to appropriate God's grace by forgiving others. As God for Christ's sake forgave us, Ephesians 4, 32, be kind, compassionate to one another, forgiving just as Christ our God forgave you. If the cause of a critical spirit is a result of our association with unhealthy peer groups, we need to associate with those who have godly values and a positive mental attitude. 1 Corinthians 5.13 Do not let anyone deceive you. Associate with bad people will ruin decent people. I kind of like that one. Mm -hmm. If the cause of a critical spirit is a result of the devil negatively impacting your life, we need to learn to resist Satan so that we will not be used by him or discouraged or hurt others. James 4, 7 and 8 Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. So um, here is a good time to enter the theme for healing, which is... Christ is my sufficiency for everything in His grace. And that's our theme. So now we're going to turn on the good stuff. What is grace? I think it's always fun to see what it looks like in the, the Hebrew and Greek. It's very pretty. So for Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of yourselves, but is a gift of God not by works, so that no one can boast. Grace. The Hebrew word for grace is chen. It is composed of a Hebrew letter chet. The word itself means beauty or loveliness, and literally in the Paleo-Hebrew means to separate from, the outside or protect life. The Hebrew word translated in English uses numerous words including grace, favor, Charm, acceptance, kindness, pleasant, precious, and elegance. As a noun, the word grace, favor, grace, it occurs 69 times in the Old Testament. Its first appearance is in Genesis 6, 8. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. The verb uses with favor can be found in the following ways. Give favor, obtain favor, and find favor. The word um, in grace in Greek means gratitude, benefit given. So how do we overcome a critical spirit? One thing for sure is we don't need to go from one extreme to another. 
That is to say, the solution is not to exchange our dull gray sunglasses for a pair of rose-tinted sunglasses. Following Christ doesn't make someone a naive person with a Pollyanna attitude. Fake smiles, repressed anger, and a lot of superficial praise the Lord's do not build up the kingdom of God. Sin needs to be first be confronted and defeated in ourselves. Jesus said that we need to first take a log out of our own eye before we can clearly enough to take the splinter out of another eye. Critical people may be missing, I'm sorry, misusing the gift of discernment. If you have that gift, be grateful to God, but don't misuse and abuse it by judging or condemning or constantly finding faults with others. So what are some crucial changes a critical person, sorry, a critical spirited person needs to consider making? So here's just a few. We need to have our spiritual eyes open to see two complementary spiritual truths, the depth of our own sin and the greater depth of God's grace towards us in Christ. Spiritual sight here isn't something we can will. God must give it. But we can ask him for it. Pray, God, would you help me to see myself more clearly and know your love more intimately? We all need to experience the depth of our own sin and the abundance of God's grace. James 4, 9 through 10. Let there be tears for the wrong things you have done. Let there be sorrow and sincere grief. Let there be sadness instead of laughter and gloom instead of joy. Then, when you realize your worthlessness before the Lord, he will lift you up, encourage, and help you. When King David's blind eyes were finally opened to his sin with Bathsheba and Uriah, he didn't merely acknowledge it. He, in some academic or emotionally removed way, he fell on his face. He wailed and he fasted. The more we experience God's grace, the more grateful we are and the more moved we are motivated to extend grace to others by being gracious and forgiving. We need to learn what to do when we're bothered by bad behavior of Christians, brothers, and sisters. We must pray for both the person and our response to them instantly and fervently. What would happen if we channeled all our critical energy to being an honest dialogue with God? It's always better to talk to God about one another than to talk about one another. It's just plain wrong for us to have a double standard, one for us and one for others. Instead of judging others, we should, like the psalmist, ask God to search and examine us. Psalms 139, 23 through 24. And this was my prayer when I finally realized I have a problem. I ask God, search me and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. If we don't take the log out of our own eye first, we are not in a position to restore a fallen sister. We must learn to engage in clear, direct, face-to-face -face communication with other people. No fake smiles, where we're trying to call darkness light. No repression of true feelings, but clear, caring, constructive communication. The goal isn't to tear down by revealing hidden flaws. It's repentance, reconciliation, and restoration of broken relationships. And remember, there's no guarantee people are going to respond the way God wants them to. We need to be encouragers, generally upbuilding others and helping them become all that they can become, and all that God longs for them to become. Get excited about building people up, not tearing them down. Be an encourager like Barnabas was to Paul. And, and trust God to provide encouragement for you as well. A timely word of genuine affirmation may mean more than you know. Encouragement empowers. It's the oxygen for the soul. Instead of seeing only the downside all around us, let's pray for the ability to see what God is doing in others' lives. And then make our own small contribution in furthering along God's good work in the lives of others. Overcoming a critical spirit can be difficult because it's developed into a life-dominating sin or bad habits. It becomes a way of life. The way to rid ourselves of a critical spirit is to put on love instead of hate, to build up instead of tearing down, and to give grace instead of grief. 
So let's move into some action. Whenever we do change and God wants to work on us, he always has us do action. So the first one um, is love instead of hate. As stated before, God commands us to love him and to love others. The simplest way to view this is stop feeding the flesh and start feeding the spirit. The Bible is chock full of things that we are to put off and things that we are to put on. 1 Peter 2 tells us to put off malice, envy, slander, and to pursue the pure milk of God's word. We are to stop returning evil for evil or insult for insult, but to give a blessing instead. Of, instead. That's 1 Peter 3, 9. Another action we need to build up instead of tearing down. A critical spirit naturally tears down, but as believers, we are called to edify others. In Romans, the Apostle Paul instructs us on how to build others up. We are to focus on pleasing our neighbor and to pursue things that make for peace. A person with a critical spirit must be renewed in the spirit of her mind, and she seeks to do all things for edifying Christ. Another action, we need to give grace instead of giving grief. As believers, our words and our lives are to reflect God's grace. We are to give grace to others instead of grief that comes from a critical spirit. Remember, let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word that is good for edifying according to the need of the moment, so that it will give grace to those who hear. Our words need to be encouraging, uplifting, and instructive even when it's corrective. We are to be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, just as God in Christ also forgave you. Christians have no business possessing a critical spirit. We have not been given authority over the hearts of others. We know we have overcome a critical spirit when we are characterized by a forgiving spirit because we have been forgiven by God. Again, how do we overcome a critical spirit? The condition of our heart is the critical spirit. Luke 6.45 says, The good person out of good treasure of his heart produces good, and the evil person out of his evil treasures produces evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. Critical words spring from a critical heart, and critical heart generally comes from a misunderstanding of God's grace, either due to pride or a simple lack of information about God's character and the meaning of salvation. Only when we understand the depravity apart from God and the depth of his grace will we be able to bestow grace onto others. Those who struggle with a critical spirit know that they can never live up to their own standards. They're constantly judging others and themselves and always coming up lacking. But Christ fills that lack. His perfect and righteous, and he freely grants us right, gr righteousness to those who believe in him. 2 Corinthians 5, 21. The better we understand God's grace, the more gracious we will be with others, and the more grateful we will be. The gift of thanks is, is a strong antidote for a critical spirit. Another important area is our thought lives. Rather than focus on what is missing, we should think about what is, again, what is true, what is honorable, what is lovely, commendable, excellent, and praiseworthy. This is not to say that we should ignore falsehood or injustice or ugliness or imperfections. However, we should not dwell on the negatives. Paul instructed in Ephesians regarding this, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ, so that the body builds itself up in love. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such is good for building up. As fits the occasion, it may give grace to those who hear. Sure, things could be better than they are, but love covers many sins. Forgiveness is a priority, as I said before. As the body of Christ, we speak of the heart of love in order to build each other up. A critical spirit only serves to tear down. It can also be helpful to remind ourselves that we do not know the thoughts or the intentions of others. I again refer that to mind reading. At times, behavior reflects motivation, but not always. Before making a critical remark, either out loud or to yourself, we should pause and consider other possibilities. Is this person truly being unkind? Or is he perhaps going through a difficult situation? 
or maybe just need some grace. The golden rule is a very helpful tool. A critical spirit tears down those around us and robs us of our own ability to enjoy life. When we become overly critical, we miss out on the beauty that God has placed all around us. Small blessings go unnoticed and we stop being thankful. Overcome a critical spirit requires gratefulness, a willingness to forgive, an accurate understanding of God's grace, for it's free. An intentional refocusing of our thoughts and commit to share the truth in love. Overcoming a critical spirit is a matter of sanctification. And we have the Holy Spirit to help with that. As we submit to God, read His Word, and pray for grace, we will find that the critical spirit gives up control to the Holy Spirit of Christ. So coming out of a critical spirit into grace, action steps again. For Christ is my sufficiency for everything. Oops, I think I was supposed to have that up. We'll go on. <laughs> so they, the other action steps, these ones are ones that you will actually put to action. So the first one is repentance of our sins. Um, a while back, I was doing a study um, on a wonderful book right here written by Anne Graham Lotz called The Daniel Prayer. In here, she gave us an exercise on examining our hearts with a list of sins. So I have that and your attachment there. The list of sins, as you can see, is pretty, pretty significant. And what she had us do is she went through the list and said, star the ones you think that you are currently struggling with. And so I did, I went through and I had four or five in there. I went, okay, good, and she goes, do it again. <laughs> so, okay, so I went through and, okay, well, to be honest with myself, yep, I have that problem too, and that one and that one. And she said, do it again. And by the last time, I had them all starred. I was guilty of them all. And so it was the most wonderful exercise I have done that I took it a bit further. I did this one time during the Bible study and it was so freeing. What I did is I took each one of these sins and I sat down and prayed the Lord to open up my heart. I used that word, show me, O Lord, if there's anything in my heart with ingratitude. And I would pray that he would show me and I wrote out a little confession to God with anything that I was ungrateful for. And then I would look in, in the Bible um, for verses that applied to whatever it was I was struggling with. I did that for all these sins. It took me a while, but it was so freeing. So a couple years later, I came across this and went, oh, I should do this again, and I did. And darn it, if I didn't have them all again, that they just slowly crept up in life. And, and maybe they weren't quite as severe as the first time, but they were still lurking in there. Um, so I thought I would read an example of one of mine. So one, um, you heard a couple times in here I mentioned self, of being part of the critical spirit. So I examined the one for self and what she wrote in here. So you might find it real quick. Well, I don't see it right now. I won't waste time looking. So I wrote under myself. I identified several areas that involved me self-fulfilling, self, self-motive, self self-righteousness, idols of self, and not pitying others first. By putting myself first, I left no room for God. I went running ahead, leaving him in the dust. I have been practicing this behavior since my 20s. I wasted so many years ruling my life with myself as king. I need and want and desire to change this behavior. I choose to leave it behind and commit my days to choose God. Even as I write this, I make mistakes and choose self. If I am to be completely used by God, I can't be blocking his work with myself. In this season of correcting and restoring, I am tempted to get down on myself. But if I confess my sins, he is faithful and just to forgive me but I also have to re the responsibility to seek forgiveness as I recognize when I am choosing self. Be open, ask for Christ to forgive me, and I can mature away from self. Christ died for me in my sins, the most selfless act, and it was for me. 
who am I to not give him the same gift of selflessness? And then I looked up um, Mark 8, 34. Jesus called the crowds together and said to them, If anyone wishes to follow me as my disciple, he must deny himself and set aside selfish interest and take up his cross, expressing a willingness to endure whatever may come and follow me, believing in me, confessing, I'm sorry, conforming to my example of living and to, if need be, suffer or perhaps dying because of faith in me. And then Philippians 2, 3, do nothing from selflessness or empty conceit through fractions, motives, or strife, but with an attitude of humility, be neither arrogant nor self-righteous, regard as more important than yourself. I do not merely look out for your own personal interest, but also for the interest of others. <laughs> I can't read my writing. So that's just a little example of how I use that tool to really pull out all those critical spirit, bad habits, all those things that built up in my heart. And then another tool here, it's called the Hertz Log. This one really helped me when I needed to see where I was lacking forgiveness. And this will really bring out um, everything. Um, I would recommend if you're gonna do something like this that you bring along somebody with you so that you don't have that tendency to fall into worthlessness, self-condemnation, and misunderstand somebody else's sin and take that on as your sin. Because there's some things that happen in life that have happened to you that are not your fault or that you had no part in. And so I recommend having somebody walk along with you in doing this. But basically what you do is in the first column is you write out the person that sinned against you or hurt you. Um, it could be a person, it could be a place like a church, school, um, institution, and you write all those down. The next one, you write what happened. What action did that person take to hurt you, the event? The next part is how has it affected you? What has it done to your heart in the past, today? You write out your feelings, what it's done to your belief system, the losses you may have suffered from or insecurities that came from that. The next part is one that's a little more difficult is you have to look at your part. Is there any part that you did in this that contributed to that? Um, who did you hurt? Was there anything you're responsible for? Are there character defects that you're practicing today because of that? Are there behaviors, choices that you made that affected you because of that? Um, and the last part, and this is where the healing comes in. This is where you repent to God and accept his gift of forgiveness. Remember, you cannot forgive yourself. Christ is the one that died on the cross for your sins. This is where you make amends for the hurts. I don't recommend necessarily going to everybody because that person may not be safe, or it could have been so long ago that you're not in touch with them, but it could still be affecting your heart. And so what I did is I wrote out letters to God, asking, uh, forgiving that person in the letter, and then asking God to forgive me if I had any part in that. And that's the part that is the healing. Because once you have repented to the Lord and you've made amends to the people that you may have needed to, that's when God can work in healing you. And it really is a healing thing. Like I mentioned before, I had drug along years of bitterness, um, unforgiveness, and I mean years. I had to go back to my 20s and ask. I didn't necessarily ask the people to forgive me, but I repented before the Lord. And it was as if... Uh, you know, it all went away. I still had hurts because those don't necessarily go away, but they didn't affect me anymore because God took that and healed it for me because Christ died on the cross for that. So this is a very good tool. Um, one of the areas, let's see, I'm kind of getting ahead of myself. Um, mm -hmm -hmm. Okay, let me go on to the next one. The one group of people these two, these are my kids. I really experienced an incredible healing with these two when I went, I went to them and because uh, they're safe, they're my kids. And I repented for all the things that I had done through their childhood, any of the irresponsibility choices that I made, and it brought such healing to us. And they were quite a bit younger when I did that. This is a recent picture. But it, it, it just drew us in. They're not um, 
it, it just it helped a lot. So it, it can be very healing, um, and that that is the girls. Mm-hmm. That, that was pre- they're pretty girls. Yeah. Had to show them off a little bit. <laughs> okay, so again the action steps: um, repentance, your list of sins; forgiveness, your list of hurts. Um, let me read a couple verses here. Uh, for the forgiveness, Matthew six fourteen through fifteen. If you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. The healing part um, is then after the forgiveness, and that's when God steps in and heals your heart. Let's see. And then the last one, um, sanctification, let me read real quick. In Matthew 6, 6 through 7, But when you pray, go to your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. When your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. When you pray, do not keep on babbling like the pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask. So again, your action steps. Um, One of the things that I found very encouraging is that God can still use you as you're coming out of your critical spirit into grace. During the time that I was doing all this work, I was um, also able to prepare to lead other women through some of this. So even though I wasn't completely healed and still had work to do, God used me to start working with other ladies. And so he doesn't let you suffer until you're completely there because that that would not be working well with sanctification because none of us would get there. So don't lose hope. You still can be used by the Lord. His mercy is so great. Look at Jonah, Moses, and even Peter. Repent of your sins equals restoration. Use God's strength. Fight the sin of a critical spirit because of the Lord's great love We are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning, and great is your faithfulness. That's Lamentations 3, 22 through 23. God delights in second chances. God won't let you refuse him. He'll keep waiting. So what's next after that? Well, as God says, he can use you. So how does that look? I found seven characteristics, and we kind of went over some of these already. Um, So now that you've done your part to move away from a critical spirit and into living in God's grace, you're able to walk along aside other people who are struggling just as you did. So some characteristics, directly face to face. You want to talk to them face to face. I know this age has kind of turned into a little bit difficult to do that, um, but to text, to write letters isn't as effective. I think loving on um, each other face to face is more productive and more healing. Um, you want to be serious. Do it soberly, not flippantly. Don't like make ha- <laughs> don't make light of sin. It's a serious business. Importantly, major offenses, not inconsequentially minor offenses. Look at the heavy sins that are going on and really dive into those. Privately, alone together, not publicly, not in the presence of others. We never want to uh, make someone feel bad for what they're struggling with. We always want to do it tenderly and kindly. Next one, lovingly, concern for the other's best interest, not maliciously, not returning evil for evil. Again, doing it very caringly. It's, It's hard to work through some of those sins that have been on their lives and hearts. Um, and be accurate. Um, don't base it on gossip. You want to check the facts and make sure you're talking to the people and not assuming what you heard. And then lastly, do it sooner than later. They have struggled long enough and they need the healing. They want to experience and need to experience God's grace and forgiveness. Hebrews 10, 24 through 25. Let's see how inventive we can be in encouraging love and helping out not avoiding worshiping together, as some do, but spurring on each other. The reason we come together as a church isn't to criticize, but to encourage. Cursing the darkness won't change anything. Instead, we must learn to light the candle. Ephesians 4.15 says that we are to speak the truth in love. In doing so, others will change for the better. 
Love encouragement is a motivational force. If we ever hope to help others, we need to learn to encourage them. Just as sugar attracts more flies than honey, so encouragement will help others more than a critical spirit or judgmental attitude. Let's use our tongues to build up and not tear down. Let no foul or polluting language or evil word or unwholesome, unworthless talk ever come out of your mouths, but only such speech as good and beneficial to the spiritual progress for others, as it is fitting to, to the need and the occasion, that it may be a blessing and give grace to those who hear it. That is Ephesians 4.29 in the Amplified Version. Isn't this what Paul says again in Ephesians 4.8 and 9? Whatever is noble, whatever is true, whatever is lovely, we need to meditate on these things. We want to fill our minds with those things. And it's best and not worse, the beautiful, not the ugly, things of praise, not things to curse. Remember, the Bible doesn't promise peace to those who dwell on their own faults or others. It says the Lord will keep them in perfect peace. Peace whose minds who stay on him. That's Isaiah 26, 3. I found that to be so true for my life as I moved into God's grace and experienced his blessings. And one last little. There we are. <laughs> That's the whole gang all together. And that is truly the blessings that God has been providing. So that's all I have. Any questions, comments? It's kind of deep. Well, it's, it's all identifiable stuff, but sometimes I just find that these things come up and it's like, where did that come from? Where did that critical... I, I mean, I'm just going along just fine, and all of a sudden, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Very much. So you can turn that off. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you don't need to turn it off. Uh, we, the other thing is, if you want interaction, then it's helpful if you restate what was stated. Cause it's not it can't hear it. Okay. So what was said is that we, it's surprising how it kind of comes out of nowhere. They were walking along, life doing really good, thinking we have good thoughts, and just kablam! Our mind goes into something we're like, what? Well, that wasn't me. No, I don't want that. no, we don't want that at all. Yeah. yeah. That's where I find it's helpful to go into that Philippians 4 8 9. What is true? Okay, what I just thought, that was not true. And Lord, that was not for me. That's not for my heart. So you get into what is true, and, and maybe even having to look up a Bible verse to support that. And, uh, or even going back to that list of sins and going, okay, is there something in my heart that I'm not seeing that I might need to really kind of muddle over a little bit again? I find that when something like that happens, I dwell on it. Mm. Mm -hmm. So that's my struggle is to get out of that dwelling on the negative. Yes. You know? Yeah. So dwelling, dwelling on that, it, and that's kind of rolling down that, hill that I think Satan tends to like to use so much. He sends that little zing through your mind and then you go off on this long road of thoughts that you're like, wait a second, come on back to the present. And then get again, clarifying your mind, renewing your mind. All right. Well, good. Thank you, ladies, for enduring this. I know this wasn't easy. So let me say a little prayer for you. All right, and everybody, Lord, thank you so much for providing this beautiful comfort that we felt in, in having to talk about something that isn't so pleasant to talk about. And I thank you, Lord, for providing your grace, your mercy, and so much forgiveness in our hearts for these things that keep creeping up, whether it's the world, whether it's our flesh, or whether it's just things that we think about from our past. Lord, I thank you that we can come to you and not have to keep it in our heart, that we can give it over to you and you heal us beautifully. So again, Lord, I just thank you for all your blessings you bestow upon us. In your precious name, amen.